Foils has always been a large part of my life, from having the run of my granddad William Foyle trying Crossroad shop as a child to unexpectedly, age 59, finding myself part of the team charged with reinventing the family business following the death of my aunt Christina Foyle. This is a personal memoir of my relationship with a great bookshop, with its founder William and with the indomitable Christina and with the many wonderful people who have worked there. It is childhood memories mingled with recent events and discoveries. It is subjective, personal, partial and incomplete. My relationship with Foils has been exhilarating, challenging, frustrating, fun and at times painful. I've tried to capture some of this. And uh, I'm going to try and capture some of it too. Here, Bill Samuel, welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. I think the way I'd like to capture it is to look at uh, these these characters. Your grandfather, William, mm -hmm. your aunt, Christina, and yourself. And there's an interesting kind of an arc. Uh, William built a very successful yes. book-selling empire. Christina oversaw its decline and you rebuilt it with the assistance of others yes absolutely so to start with you talk about your passion for books and the acceptance of others for what they are not from whence they came you mentioned that as being a lesson lessons that you learned from William yes what else did you learn from him Most of what made me what I am, I think. William was a, an extraordinarily generous person. He was utterly dedicated to getting books into people's hands. He never set out to make a fortune or to build a business. He set out to get books into the hands of every man. We're just digressing very briefly, we've just received the digitised version of the Foils Archive, which is 100,000 documents going back to the very beginning of the 20th century. And I'm starting to slowly browse through it. And I find it quite extraordinary that within about 10 years of setting up business, he was the biggest bookseller in London. Mm -hmm. the he business... set it up in 1903. Right? 1903 he yeah. started. Okay, yeah. The first press cuttings I've got are from 1910, when he had just moved into newer premises, larger premises in Trancross Road. And at that time, he was boasting about having a mile of bookshelves and I think about a million books. And he built up this business without any outside finance. Mm. He never had other investors coming in. Everything was built up on reinvested profits. And by the time he died, the business was worth, in today's money, about £100 million, totally from reinvestment, owned by, effectively, three or four family members. That was it. And that is extraordinary in mm. this day and age. So what did I learn from him? He, he was, I said, he, he, was, he was very generous, he was very kind, he was very dedicated and passionate. He was a decent man. I never heard him say anything unkind about other people. He might have said something truthful that they might not have wanted to hear, but he was never unkind. He was a good, nice man, and he passed on that value down through my mother. Well, one of the things that struck me was... Uh he invited and encouraged you as a little boy to check out his library to to hold the books to yes. to you know not you know it wasn't something you couldn't do it was no. the opposite of that yes he was a great collector and he built up one of the finest libraries in the world and we had the run of it as as children and there were Caxton's, there were the first four folios of Shakespeare, there were most wonderful illuminations. So you actually saw those and touched them? We, we were encouraged to handle them. That's great. His yeah. third folio of Shakespeare belonged to Samuel Pepys, 
and was annotated by Samuel Pepys. And if you can imagine what it's like to a seven or eight-year-old to be given this huge leather-bound volume and be told, yeah, that belonged to Samuel Pepys. Have a look. Here's what he wrote. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's magic. Yeah, no wonder. No wonder. Well, it, it was in your blood, but it's not that you were involved in the book business uh, no. throughout your life. Uh, we'll get to that. But, but it, it's quite late in your life that you become involved with Boyle. Very late. Yeah. Well, a bit more on William. Uh, he was a cockney. He had shoulder-length silver hair. And look, yes. what, I, look what I'm looking at. <laughs> it's not <laughs> deliberate. <laughs> That's COVID, is it? <laughs> it's partly COVID, but I, I always wear my hair fairly long. He suffered from a uh, degree of deafness. Yes, which I do too. Okay. How did that affect things? Uh, he had hearing aids, which he could diplomatically switch off if <laughs> people were saying things he'd prefer not to hear. Right. Um, we made allowances for it. I think the way my children and grandchildren make allowances for my deafness. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. He was a great innovator, and uh, it wasn't just a bookstore. He started off in the second-hand book business yes. with his brother Gilbert. Yes. Then he got into uh, selling uh, new books, and I, I was intrigued to learn that uh, Heinemann was one of the first uh, to do business with them. Yes. I think he started selling new books after about 10 years yeah. and became, in a fairly short space of time, a very significant market for the publishers because at that time there were no chain bookstores. There were some wonderful bookstores like Blackwell's in Oxford, Heffers in Cambridge, a number of others, but Foyle's in Trancross Road pretty soon was up there with the, the largest and were a significant customer. He also brought in a, a, a worldwide uh, mail-order business, yes. a, a right wing to sort of counter Golanz's yes. left wing. Yes. And, a, and lending libraries, too. Yes. That was something that's, that's kind of lost in the, in, in the mists of time now. But in the 1930s, Foyles had a chain of more than 4,000 lending libraries, yeah. not just in the UK, but in the UK, Ireland, Palestine, India, and I think in Australia. There were very, very few public libraries at that time, and Foyles lending libraries would lend out books at, I think, a penny a time, and it was a significant part of the business. But now it's, it's gone and lost. I need to trawl through the archives and find out what I can about it. Yeah, and again, it just shows uh, what an interesting creative mm. mind he had to to, uh, yes. to look at all these different ways of of uh, making a profit from books. Yes, he had. I mean, he, from secondhand books, he went to new books, and in the nineteen twenties and thirties, it was a period of great innovation in in foils. He set up the Welsh Publishing Company because there was a large community of Welsh-speaking people in London and they didn't have access to Welsh-language books. So he started publishing Welsh-language books in England and then he started publishing in Wales books in English about Welsh matters. He set up a language course on records equivalent to the old linguaphone called Foilophone, which died a death fairly soon. He set up a filmmaking company. He sold, because he sold books about music, he started to sell sheet music and then recorded music and then musical instruments from a second shop in Trancos Road. Mm. And it was constant innovation. Yeah, yeah. He had a travel agency. Travel agency, yes. Yeah. I, I booked my first skiing holiday uh, through the Falls Travel Agency, travelling by bus to Kitzbühel in Austria. <laughs> uh, he had a philately department selling stamps that came in on the huge post we had every morning. That's right. So he took advantage of all these... Absolutely. It was a free free product for him yes. to sell. Yes. That's, gr yes. that's good. Yes. It was constant innovation. He was also a great enabler of people. And when my aunt Christina Foyle was... 18, she said to him that 
she thought it would be a great idea if they had a sort of forum where readers could meet writers. And he simply said to her, great, go ahead and do it. And he made facilities available, and she set up her first ever literary luncheon. Yeah. And they then ran for 70 years. Yeah. When Victor Gallantz brought out the left-wing book club, uh, William Foyle and my father were talking in the pub one evening. And my dad said, shouldn't we set up a right-wing book club to counter it? And William said to my dad, go ahead and do it. So dad did. And William could see the, the strength of an idea and let someone else run with it. He didn't try and keep control of everything for himself. It's another secret to success, then. Absolutely. You talk uh, in, in very moving terms about uh, this, and I don't know, pronunciation is Beale, Beale? Be, Beale Abbey. Yes. Beale Ab Abbey. Yeah. That, uh, that he bought in a, there's a, an interesting little factoid here. He spent you say, 4,400 pounds yes. on his folio, third folio that you talked about. And that was slightly more than what he paid for, uh, yes. for the Abbey. Yes. That, it gives a, an idea of the cost of rare books. Yeah. The, the, the Abbey, which is still, it belongs to my cousin Christopher. Mm. It is one of the loveliest country houses I've ever seen. It's the remains of a 12th century abbey built in 1172, uh, sold off by Henry VIII in 1539, and a lot of it fell into disrepair. But what is left is a beautifully proportioned, stone-built uh, house of half a dozen main bedrooms, very large rooms downstairs with vaulted marble pillars and vaulted stone ceilings. Mm. And you grew up in, or you were there every we'd, couple of weeks. Uh, we, we'd go there every school holiday yeah. for a week or so, mm -hmm. several Christmases. And it had about, I think when he bought it, it had a few hundred acres of land, uh, largely farmland. But he, if any adjacent land came up for sale, he bought it. And I think by the time he died, it had probably close to a thousand acres of land so uh, in, including a lot of marshland and the golf course the other side of the river there's a river running through it beautiful <laughs> you call it a paradise it was it was i mean it was one that because when, when you're a child the mm. sun always shines as you know and to have holidays there and just have the the run of the library when it wasn't fine to be outside and the run of this lovely garden when it was. Mm. A, a, yeah, a beautiful house. Plus the library there, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned him being generous. He paid for the education of uh, all of his grandchildren. Yes. He, uh, he bought his children houses and cars. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes. And I love this one. When you went to the, sh the shop, he'd let you loose. And yes. whatever books you, <laughs> you look, like the looks of, yes. he'd let you have. Yes. That's yes. great. I mean, the, uh, I think stock control then was not what stock control is now. <laughs> and I would go there with my three sisters and we would wander around the shop in the morning and gather up with no exaggeration, armfuls of books and stagger into his office under the weight of these books and say, can we have these, Granddaddy? He'd say, yeah, go on, take them. And uh, <laughs> we'd drive in with my father and he'd drive us back late afternoon when he finished his, his, his work and we'd just load these books into the back of the car and go home and that would keep us engrossed for days, weeks. <laughs> so... A couple things then. It, I mean, he he diversified, mm. so I, I guess that's one reason for his success. Yes, and he he was keen to sort of have a universal appeal. Yes, what else uh, um, explains this enormous success of his? I think 
Because a lot of the books he was selling were second-hand, um, you know yourself from all the interviews, selling books is not a hugely profitable business. It's an enormously satisfying business, but it's not hugely profitable. But second-hand books have a much higher margin. Mm -hmm. And people have a passion for second-hand books. People would bring in their second-hand books in, into our basement where we bought and get paid pennies for them and they take those pennies and go upstairs and <laughs> buy more to take home. Yeah, it's like free money. Yes. In a way. So there was a high profit margin and any time he had surplus money he invested in property. So that Foils from very early on owned the freehold of its own property. And freeholds in central London appreciated very nicely. So the the, the book trade has its ups and downs. In a downturn in the economy, book trades suffer. Mm. But Foils had this wonderful cushion of owning its own freehold, so not having to pay rent at times were hard because mm. we had no outside investors and so on. So that enabled Foils to ride out recessions. And yes, and just the constant innovation and so on. It was over the generations a successful business. Yeah, I'm thinking of the Strand in New York, the only one stand left standing as well. Yes. And they uh, trade in... Second hand. Yeah, they've yes. got a, a beautiful third floor full yes. of them. And Powell's in Oregon. That's right. Portland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it really, uh, it's an interesting formula. Yes. Now, one of the things that that he also stood for, William, you say, was was fairness. Yes. So, Christina, his daughter, he handed it over to her in the late forties. Yes. The running of foils. Do you think she was fair? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, she, she wasn't. I've never fully understood why William so favoured Christina, but she was absolutely the apple of his eye. My mother was the oldest child, but my mother was a, a very maternal person. I mean, she had a very sharp business mind. She was, I think, far sharper than Christina. And had she been so inclined, I think she would have actually run the business significantly better. But my mother was not a forceful person. And when she got married, Christina, who by then was already very much his, her father's favorite, told my mother that Foyles actually didn't employ married women. So my mother went away and had four children mm -hmm. and led a very satisfied, fulfilled life and was, as I said, a very sharp person and an extremely fair person. But Christina was not fair. Christina was a very um, self-centered person. She, she was a, a complete mixture of things. She was very beautiful, very charming, very witty, could be extraordinarily generous and could be extraordinarily vindictive. She was unpredictable and she did exactly what she wanted. And she was cushioned financially by being gifted the, a majority shareholding in this business. And the business included, as I said, a significant property portfolio. So from that time, you know, Christina never had to worry about money. So she did absolutely what she wanted. She was not maternal in the very least. She didn't like children, made that fairly plain. But all that said, she could be great fun. I, I went skiing with her and her husband when I was nine years old, and um, she was excellent company. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I think I must have read it in a, in a biography of Alan Lane. Hmm. Now, did he date? What, what exactly happened between those two? Were they just companions? Or? I think they were just companions. They were just good friends. She was a very attractive woman. Mm -hmm. I never knew if she had any extramarital affairs. 
her husband was extremely subservient. In the business, right? He was in the business and in life. Yeah. They, they'd known each other since they were four. They were mm. childhood sweethearts. And, um, mm. But she very much was, was the boss in the relationship. Now, you reference uh, some darker incidents. She was at a hospital in Margate for six months. Yes. And does she reference this as, as being... There were soldiers around and something no. sexual, probably, or abuse? No, all, or... all I know is what I got from my, my mother. She was ill. Tuberculosis, I think. And went to this hospital for six months, and it was a long way from London, and it was during the First World War when travel was difficult, and her parents didn't visit her once in the hospital and that most of the other patients in the hospital were soldiers coming back from the First World War. And we heard from somewhere she used to dance on the table for them, and I can imagine soldiers coming back from the war to have a, a bright and chirpy four-year-old um, would be very nice, but I just suspect something happened, because when she came back, uh, I remember my mother telling, telling us, my mother was waiting for her little sister. My mother was only 18 months older than Christina, and Christina came toddling up the path to the front door, my mother stood waiting with open arms, and Christina just shoved her aside. So um, Christina was not a happy little girl, and ever since then I think she's just done things her own way. So she, she took over the business, and slowly ran it into the ground? Yes. And why is that? I can track the, the end of innovation from when Christina took over. There was really very few new developments from 1950 onwards. It had great momentum. It was the largest book-selling business in the English-speaking world. It had huge international mail order. It used to receive 35,000 letters every morning. 35,000? 35,000 every morning. Most of them containing checks, postal orders, cash, cowrie shells, monkey skins, whatever currency to pay for books. Mm -hmm. Plus it had its very successful book clubs which at their peak had half a million members. And at that time, they, the members paid monthly up front five shillings a month or something. Mm -hmm. But the equivalent of, say, 10, 15 pounds a month. Well, half a million, 10, 15 pounds every month, when Foyles got 90 days credit from the publishers, as an enormous float of money. So that cushion carried the business, but there was no innovation and service gradually fell away because after a while she, she lost interest in, in the business. She lived in this beautiful house, the old abbey out in, in, in the country with a wonderful garden, and she loved her garden. She loved music, she played the piano very competently, uh, she loved entertaining, she loved going out to nice restaurants, uh, she loved her literary lunches, but I know it sounds silly, I don't think she was a book lover. She used to read, but she didn't read as anything like as widely or as extensively as, as William did, and the business just gradually dwindled away. And by the time she died, Foyles had become a laughingstock. Well, in fact, Perhaps you could describe what was involved in actually purchasing a book. <laughs> oh, so many people still uh, bring this up. Wendy Cope wrote a poem about it, right? Wendy Cope wrote a lovely poem in the, in the, in, in the 1980s, and I think I quote it in full in the book. Yeah. But basically, to buy a book, because Christina didn't, didn't trust anyone with, with cash, Yeah. you had to find the book you wanted you then had to find an assistant and that assistant had to write you out a 
a, a chit in duplicate and you then had to take that chit to a, an enclosed cashier's area and pay for it and the cashier would stamp the chit and then you had to go back and find the same assistant again who would then hand over the book and in a, in a busy period you know when Foyles was uh, the, the main bookshop of London and you would get thousands of people in there at a time this didn't make for easy easy commerce yeah I think you mentioned the fact that uh, people got so sick and tired of waiting that they just walked out either throwing the book aside or taking it with them or sticking it in their pocket when I first got involved and given that in its heyday in the 60s foils employed about 350 people when I joined the payroll was down to 72 of whom only about half were on the shop floor. And as they were working shifts, only maybe half of those were actually present at any one time. So finding someone to serve you when there were 26 different departments, and probably, as I said, only about 35 salespeople, was extraordinarily difficult. And I would see customers wandering around, holding up a book, saying, can someone please help me? Well, and, and that was one of the first things that you did, wasn't it? You bumped up the, the staff. Yes. Right? But that was also one of the reasons that they were so successful in the past is because the people that sold the books in the stores were incredibly knowledgeable. Oh, yes. To just let them go? Yes. One of the great strengths, and it's the strength of any good bookshop, is the the quality of the staff. And I, I learned this very early on, I, I, after I got involved. I, I was talking to a lady in our archaeology department who had a degree in archaeology. Most of Foyle's staff have, have academic degrees. And I, I, I have an interest in a comparatively obscure explorer called Ibn Battuta. A, any Arabist knows Ibn Battuta. He was Moroccan but not, not widely known. And I, I read a report in Sunday papers of a new biography of his, and I went to the archaeology department, and I said to this young, young lady, the new biography of Ibn Battuta, do we have it? And she said, yes, we do. She said, but there was a rather better one written by an American about 10 years ago. I think you'd prefer that. That's good, yeah. And I that's thought that, that's the knowledge that you want from a good bookseller. Yeah. Yeah, it's about uh, you've only got a limited amount of time on your hands yes. to read, and yes. you want to read the best that's yes, there. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so there was that. I guess there was a fair amount of shoplifting, but there was also fraud. Oh, yes. <laughs> there was rampant fraud, and mm. everyone knew it in, in the book trade. I think Christina knew it, but just preferred not to deal with it mm. because she had enough money. But... It's very easy to understand how fraud comes about. There was a very flat structure in the shop. There was the general manager, the assistant manager, and then everybody else. And the general manager, and this was at the turn of the 20th, 21st century, so in, in the year 2000, the general manager was getting, I think, £22,000 a year, which even 20 years ago was hardly a living wage. So, I won't say his fingers were in the till, but he was susceptible to financial inducement from publishers and so on. Yeah, how, how could that work? What, how could he make the money? The most blatant frauds were books being ordered, coming in, offloaded in our yard, left there until Sunday... Sunday morning, white van would turn up, load up with these books, drive it over to Holland, where the books were sold. That was the most blatant. The publishers would offload uh, unwanted books on us. The finest example I found of that when we did our first stock, stock check, I found we had 23 copies of a Chinese cookery book in Armenian. Well, yeah. the demand for Chinese cookery books in Armenian in London is slim. Yeah, and the, the it's not many, a bestseller. But and also we had um, we were grossly overstocked with stationery, and I went through the stationery invoices. You know why we should buy several hundred 
red ballpoint pens when we only had 70 staff, I have no idea. Our maintenance bills were absurdly high. The managers responsible for taking the dis these purchasing decisions would get nice holidays paid for and so on. We, we identified £6 million worth of fraud. Uh, we know there was several times that. And we investigated, we had a very thorough investigation. We, we took half a dozen people to court. We got rid of two or three of the senior people. I considered suing our auditors because it was something that the auditors really should have picked up on. But we decided, no, draw a line underneath it, move forward. Mm -hmm. Not worth dwelling on. It yeah. was done, over. And she gave one of these managers £100,000, is that right? Yes. Which, which sort of speaks to her poor judgment in yes. Uh, yes. people. She, mm. she made very few bequests in her will, but she left 100000 to an, the ex-manager who'd been as guilty as anyone, and he was found guilty in the courts. Uh, she left 100000 to one of her gardeners on the condition that he look after her dog. Well, he had the dog put down the day after she died. And also, we strongly suspect that he was behind a burglary at one of her houses. She was not, not a good judge of character. But she did something with Tim Waterstone early on. Yes. There were some premises uh, that, that were part of foils in Trancos Road, but they were the only part that was leasehold. The leasehold was up for renewal and Christina couldn't be bothered to renew it. And she read about this nice young man, Tim Waterstone, who'd set up his first shop in uh, Gloucester Road. And she invited him round for a drink to her apartment, which then was on the second floor. And she pointed to these premises just over the road and said, so young man, would you like to take over the lease? And Tim said, thank you very much. And he did. Yeah. And the, rest, I, the rest is history. The rest is history. But, but he's, he's written a book too. Have you read it? I have, yes. What do you think of it? I find it interesting. Yeah? It's worth but reading then. It's wor worth reading. It, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, Tim was so much part of the book trade in the last quarter of the 20th century. But I was talking to him a few years ago, talking about these premises he took over. And he said, yes, the nice thing was that um, Christina took two years to get the electricity supply out of Foyle's name. So for two years, <laughs> Foyle's paid Tim Waterstone's electricity bill. Yeah, good. Well, you do mention that there's a sort of a degree of collegiality in the business that, yes. uh, that you don't find uh, elsewhere. No. It's, it's something I, I, have, I have loved. Yeah. I, I spent much of my life in finance. I'm an accountant by background, by training. And I had a spell in investment banking, which was, as I frequently say, the, the, the most remunerative and the least rewarding period of mm. my life. But as soon as I landed in the, in the book trade, I, I just found everyone so very supportive. And I think people had a great fondness for foils. Mm. And they, they really wanted to see it succeed. Yeah. And we got a lot of support from publishers. We got a lot of support from customers a lot of support from authors. That's our, our sort of three congregations that, uh, you know, they all interlink. So just to summarize then, she was a notoriously bad employer. That's, yes. that's the one, and she had a disdain for her staff. Oh, yes. Uh, what else contributed to the, the ultimate downfall? Like just dis disorganization and... Uh... Disorganization, lack of interest, lack of spending any money at all, the premises was so run down. Mm. Uh, it was difficult to find the books. The shelving was chaotic. Books were piled up because the staff were not appreciated. And that just shows. And the customers picked it up. And eventually the customers drifted away to significantly better shops. Waterstones opened their big shop in, in Piccadilly. Uh, we had Blackwells across the road, an excellent shop. Borders had come on the scene, and mm. they were directly over the road. Lively, bright, airy, welcoming. I, I used to look out of the window, and I'd, I'd watch people walking out Trancos Road, and Borders kind of hoovered them in. 
And people would walk past foils and look in and shudder and walk on. Well, let's uh, move then from Christina to you. You say in the memoir that you don't remember meeting your father until you were five years old. Yeah. And that you, you rarely got any physical contact from him other than a handshake. Yeah. I, my father was a, one of the many, many victims of the war uh, that have forgotten. He wasn't wounded, but he spent six years in the army and the last three years he was in the Middle East he was in Alexandria and then when the war finished he was moved to Palestine spent a year in, in Palestine so he came home in 1946 I was born in 1941 well my younger sister was conceived in 1943 so I know my father was home on leave then but from then on he didn't come home so I, I have no memory of him from when I was two but this man arrived I had four sisters I had a very competent quietly powerful mother uh, we had a, a maid who lived in and so we were Five females and me, age five, the only man of the house, mm. and suddenly this stranger turns up. And yeah. mm. um, so how'd you get along with him then? I got along with him, but he he was an outsider. We had we were a, a tight unit. We'd bonded, and he. He he was he was a very kind man. He he was great at taking in strangers and dogs, but he actually he didn't really know how to relate to his his family. That's probably a, overstating it. But also he was of his generation. He, you know, my generation and younger generations, we're lucky. We <laughs> enjoy physical contact. Yeah. And having three sisters and a lovely warm mother, I love physical contact. My father didn't. It didn't come natural to him. So he would shake my hand. And, you know, I went off to boarding school from the age of seven, which I loved, incidentally. A mm. lot of people say how cruel. But, no, when you've got lots of sisters at home for the holidays and lots of boys at school for the term time, I think that was a pretty good balance. But I would come home and Dad would shake my hand. I never got a hug. I get lots of hugs from my mother and my sisters. <laughs> so, yeah, so that kind of made me who I am. Yeah, you weren't damaged then. I don't think I was the least bit damaged. No, no, it doesn't sound like it. Although you do say that you were branded as a failure at 18. <laughs> How does yeah. that work? I, I went to um, one of our great public schools which uh, is actually a private school it's, that's an anomaly of the system yep. and I'll try and be objective, I, I was pretty good academically so I was sort of earmarked for Oxford or Cambridge and when the time came I was the first year not to do compulsory military service so all those before me had done their military service so they were coming out of the army or navy and going at taking up their places at university. So there was a double intake for a couple of years. I see. And I passed lots of exams to get into Oxford or Cambridge, and I was weeded out on interviews. They had to weed people out. No one kind of told me there were other universities were available because it was Oxford or Cambridge or nothing. So having been rejected, I um, had to make a living. So I've always been mathematical. I became chartered accountant which involved what apprenticing it an apprenticeship effectively mm -hmm. it was articles uh, you earned a pittance for five years how was your self-esteem oh, my self-esteem was fine I make a joke of it when I say I was branded a failure because I've never I've had some glorious failures in life but I've never considered myself a failure <laughs> 
Uh, you went to Kenya and yep. uh, felt completely at home there. Yes. I, w- I had a couple of years in, in Copenhagen. My first wife was Danish, and I worked in Copenhagen for Price Waterhouse, one of the big accounting firms. And then the, there really wasn't an option of staying on in Copenhagen because their tax system had a weird anomaly where after, in the third year you would have been taxed almost out of existence. I'd always dreamt of Africa. I read books in my childhood by G.A. Henty and King Solomon's Mines and this sort of stuff. And a, a, a not brilliant book called Wings Over the Zambezi, which inspired me to want to go to Africa. And mm. I found a job advertised uh, with one of the accounting firms in Nairobi. So I went there on a two-year contract, and I stayed for nine years. And I just... I was 26 when I went there, and I just loved East Africa. It was just post-independence, and it was a vibrant, exciting country to be in. It was developing rapidly. It was well-governed. It had a lovely climate. It was a wonderful place to bring up children. And every time I return, I feel I'm home. I, I go back to Kenya most years if I can. You've led a very interesting uh, life as a, as a business entrepreneur, a consultant. Uh, yes. In the uh, in the travel tourism business, yes. and uh... I, I've, I spent three the first three years in Kenya working in the accounting firm, and then I got involved in tourism developments, uh, not with any degree of success, but with an awful lot of fun, and <laughs> learned quite a lot about tourism in a a developing country in the ni- early 1970s when mass travel was just sort of coming in and becoming available. So that taught me something about about tourism. I returned to the UK in the mid-70s when my children, my first two daughters, were reaching an age when education became significant and we just thought the standard in Kenya was really not good enough, so we returned to the UK. And then I started going out to the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, working in financial services. I got headhunted by a client, which was an investment bank, and I spent four years with them. High-flying, extraordinarily, grossly overpaid. <laughs> and that came to an abrupt halt as, as employment uh, with Arab companies can. And I, I, the, I'm not disparaging of Arabs at all. I feel privileged to have worked uh, within the Arab world. I enjoyed it enormously, culturally. I, I love it. But when you come to the end of your time with them, then it's very abrupt. And they, I wouldn't say they suss me out, but they, they um, after three and a half years, the chief exec took me aside and said that I wasn't a corporate person. Mm-hmm. And I could have told them that on day one had they but asked. So I, I suddenly found myself nearly 50 and unemployed, unemployable, huge mortgage, and so on. So I touted around for business, and I got some work in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And that, that led to a long relationship with Turks and Caicos Islands, which I'm writing about at present, mm. which is enormously enjoyable. Um, I was their director of tourism for six months. I was their superintendent of banking and offshore finance for six months. And I was their government representative in London for 10 years. Um, Great fun. And then your mother asked that you be appointed to the board of Foils when Christina died. Yes. Were you welcome? Uh, I, the first time I went round the shop, one of my cousins took me round to introduce me to the staff. I, I met not exactly open hostility, but the staff, none of the staff would look me in the eye. I think they saw me as just another member of the Foyle family uh, for whom they had no affection. But I, I'm quite a gregarious person. I like people. And I set out to get to know the staff. I would go for a drink with them after work, which was unheard of by other members of the family. 
and yeah, pretty soon I, I found that they, they were they were responding. And I, I found also there was a huge well of affection for foils, even from the staff, who mm. had been treated so shabbily by Christina. Mm -hmm. But they, were, they, they loved foils with a passion. What about other members of the, the board? Uh, we, we got on well enough. Got on well enough. I, I just had a different approach to life. Mm. But... Um, we, you know, between us, we, well, let's just say between us, we turned the business around. Yeah, you say some interesting things uh, in this period. For example, you, you suggest that the tr uh, book trade defies most commercial logic. Yes. And so why is that? Well, it, it's, a, it's a business where there's a, a vast number of different items sold in tiny quantities. We had more than half a million different titles in foils. Um, I, I have an old old friend who used to have a chain of hardware stores, and I asked him out of interest how many stock items he had. <laughs> and he sort of swelled with pride and said, we have 35,000. And I said, we've got 600,000. And each one sells for ten pounds. Each one's got a unique selling proposition yes. too. <laughs> but yeah. I was taking a party of journalists around the shop, and one of them said to me, "She too couldn't see the commercial logic of book selling." And she she said, "So explain to me, please, if I want a book and I can't find it in the in the shop, what do I do?" I said, "Well, you go up to the department manager here." And you tell him what you want, and he will place an order with the publisher, and the publisher will send it to us, and he will phone you up and say, we have your book in stock, and if we're lucky, the customer will come back and collect it. And she said, and the gross margin on that book is three pounds? You know, it, 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 does, it defies commercial logic, but somehow it works. Yeah, I suppose it's all part of the mystery and yes. magic. You also say something lovely here on page 78. The book trade touches peripherally on everything. Most prominent people at some point write at least one book, and books are written on every conceivable subject. Yes, that's what I absolutely love about it. An old man I knew was in hospital, but not very long to live, and I wanted to go and see him and take him a gift. He had spent his working life with the Singer Sewing Machine Company. He loved the Singer Sewing Machines with a passion. I looked for a suitable book, and browsing round our crafts department, I found a book on collectible sewing needles. <laughs> Here's an interesting observation. You say uh, that... Uh, what you had inherited upon Christina's death was not the ownership of the business, but the responsibility of its management, a responsibility which she had neglected for a decade or more. So what does that mean? My mother had a very modest shareholding. She owned about 8%. Okay. I have three sisters, and we're all treated absolutely equally. So I was set to inherit 2% of the business. So it is not a significant ownership stake. I never had a significant ownership stake. Christina's shares, she left to charity. What was that deal there? Well, she, she wasn't charitable. She thought any charity was better than leaving it to her family. So Yeah, that's, that's uh, bitter. Yes, but fortunately, the, her executors used her wealth to set up the Foil Foundation, which disperses two or three million pounds a year because it, it's got about a hundred million of assets. And my, cous my cousin and sisters and I bought Christina's shares from the executor. So my 2% was leveraged up to 10% or so. But it did mean that until, well, I always had a very minority share ownership, but I had full time that I could dedicate to the business. And you didn't get paid for that, right? 
Not initially. No. Uh, eventually, I got a very modest director's fee. Serious management was desperately needed. Yeah. And my cousin, who was a chairman, had other business interests, which took up quite a bit of his time. So I sort of stepped in and... Uh, Put a plan together. Yes. Right. And so what did that plan look like? Luckily, because Christina was so very conservative and because the cash flow had been strong in the past, the, there was a fair amount of cash available. So by and large, we allocated about a third of the available money to renovating the premises, a third to keep us working capital, and a third to um, put into a sort of marketing effort. So you pretty well had to fix up the destination first. Yes. We knew we had to become a destination again. Yeah. Uh, we still carried probably the broadest stock of any shop in, in the UK. Which is a big draw. Yes. And we did have a nucleus of very knowledgeable staff. So we started recruiting good staff. We tarted up the premises a bit, um, just cosmetically at first, but mm. eventually when we could, we did a major sort of remodeling of it. In that remodeling, what, what were the most important criteria? We put in some new lifts, elevators. And that helped what? It helped the flow of customers through the building, which was very important because we spread over five floors. You've got about, what is it, is it a half an acre? Yeah, it was about half an acre, central yeah. London. But if, if, if the circulation of customers was all sort of sclerotic and gummed up, then, you know, people aren't going to go upstairs if they have to wait for a creaking old lift yeah. or climb up five flights of stairs. What we, about escalators? Did you have any of those? We had a couple of, uh, three or four escalators, uh, which were put in by Christina totally haphazardly. And that, in fact, we took all of them out because it was better to have wide accessible staircases and a couple of decent elevators. So we did that. We put in a, a cafe. A, ja a jazz. Uh... Jazz cafe, which came about because we were approached by a, a jazz shop that was being forced out of business. And they phoned us up and asked if we'd like to buy them. And I said, no. I said, we're not interested in buying a jazz shop. We want to set up a cafe. And they said, well, come and talk. And I went and talked to them. And they took me to their local coffee shop. And between the coffee shop and the jazz shop and foils, we we got a very nice, relaxed jazz cafe going. The, the day it opened looked as if it had been there for 50 years. <laughs> right. It was just great. You also mentioned playing the, the family business card. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of affection for family businesses. I'm a great fan of family businesses. I, I, I think they're, they're the keystone of any economy. It's rare for a family business to... Hang on for a hundred years, though. Very rare, but Foyles had, and I thought it important that we continue and that we kind of let the world know that we are still a family business now run by the third generation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was primarily a image uh, marketing um, yes. emphasis, focus. Yes. I think that an, an awful lot of people would would rather buy from a business that is run by its owners yeah. than that belongs to some distant corporation. And I think also, that it's, it's quite hard to explain this without sounding patronizing, but I think for the staff, it meant something that they knew the owners. I spent a lot of time walking around the shop. I got to know the staff. I tried to take an interest in them. And it is a different atmosphere to a company that is run by professional managers who have no direct stake in the success of the company. Yeah, there's a couple things here. You say, uh, for example, that uh, a family business typically cares more about the process than the profit. Yes, absolutely. And, we, we, and we what, were... taking pride in the process or what? Oh, of course. Uh, you know, the... the efficiency of the business and the success of the business was a it's very much a reflection of the values of the family that own it and you can see this in any number of family-owned owned businesses 
which you know there there are still still some of the big names are still family owned. Yeah, it's interesting. We're here in the well. What's this area called in France? It's the Gers. The Gers, G E R S. Okay. So it's we're part the... of Aquitaine, Gascony. I never know how they divide it up. Well, we're here in France, and uh, I just happened to have interviewed someone about Gaston Gallimard. Yes. There's a wonderful family yes. run business that's yes. more than 100 years old, and he talked about uh, the soul of the company, the, the yes. soul of the family, this magical ingredient that was hard to get elsewhere. Yes. It is very important. It's the heart of most economies. And why is that again? I think people like dealing with people rather than you know, dealing with a distant organization. We like efficiency, obviously, which is the success of Amazon, which is a wonderful business, mm -hmm. much as we in the book trade have resented it. It's a wonderful business. An incredible focus on the customer. Yeah. Yes. And I think that actually does reflect the values of Jeff Bezos who started it. So although Amazon is not a family business, I think it still very much reflects the founder's approach to things. But I don't really like going into a supermarket because you feel that you are just at the mercy of the vast machine. It seems to me that you basically tried to re-diversify in a way. Yes. To, you, it was a, a focus on the destination for sure and making yeah. it lively and a place that people wanted to, uh, to visit. But you did get into a, a number of different... We, we set up a significant program of events... Uh, we set up the cafe, as I said, and we tried one or two other ventures that didn't didn't really work. So the the heart of the business has to be selling books, but y you have to find ways of extracting money from people, other than just the slim margin mm. on a book. And what was the most successful way of doing that? Our cafe has been a huge success. I know that it sounds such a small thing, a cafe, but it draws people into the shop. And or you had music in music the cafe. Music in the cafe. Live music. Live music. And we used to have, before we moved premises six years ago, sorry, I say we, yeah. because <laughs> yeah. it's no longer... Yeah, yeah we're getting to that. It, it was, you draw people into the shop and you, you find ways of getting them to pay for things. So the... A good program of events, we make 70% margin on a cup of coffee and 40-45% on a book. So, as the Americans say, do the math. Hmm. Any other way of making money? Nothing I can think of. Tell me if I've forgotten something. <laughs> You uh, were involved in setting up the Dubai Literary Festival. Yeah. One of the things that you say is uh, you tried to make sure nothing, <laughs> nothing went wrong. That's what you did. <laughs> yes. That, that, that came about because we were looking for diversification uh, by setting up other shops. And we set up some other shops in London. But because of my connections with the Arabian Gulf... I, I still go out there from time to time. I, you, I used to stop off in Dubai to see friends if I was on the way to somewhere nicer like Sri Lanka or Maldives or somewhere. And I thought, well, when I'm in Dubai, I'll, I'll sort of assess what possibilities there are here. And I got to know some of the local booksellers, including a remarkable lady named Isabel Abelhul, who was an English lady married to an, an Emirati guy, and Isabel had built up a chain of bookstores, I think the biggest in the Gulf. And we were having coffee on one of my trips and um, talking about everything that goes on in Dubai. I should say I'm no, I, I don't like what Dubai has come, but I understand why it's come, become what it has. But I first went there 40 years ago when it was a charming little town on the creek. But... We said, well, you know, Dubai has a film festival, a food festival, an art festival, a shopping festival. And a friend who was with us said, 
but it doesn't have a literary festival. So Isabel and I looked at each other, she the biggest bookseller in the Gulf, me a bookseller from London, and uh, we thought, yes, we'll set up the... Um, Their private jet, someone's private yeah, jet. It's small thing. Okay. <laughs> we we thought we'll set up. Her business is called Magrudy's, the Foils Magrudy's Literary Festival, and I then went back to England and kind of forgot about it. And Isabel then phoned me up and said, "Do you remember that festival idea?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, "Well, Emirates are going to fund it." And my first thought was, "Oh shit." <laughs> <laughs> We've now got to set up a festival. I How did that help your business, though? Well, eventually it, ha- it, it had no spin-off benefit to Foils at all. But I could use my connections through Foils to try and persuade publishers and authors that a literary festival in Dubai was not an oxymoron. And I, I won't go into the very long story, because it is very long, but I uh, persuaded the lady who later became my wife to be the program director and between us we set up the Dubai Literary Festival which got off to a shaky start involving Margaret Atwood we'll just leave it at that <laughs> absolutely yeah. yes who subsequently came out and was yes. has been very supportive and is a remarkable lady one, one thing I loved about her when she came out you know she's one of the most successful novelists in the world she there's nothing grand about her yeah. and i saw her once on the fringe of the festival where some school kids from dubai were performing shakespeare to an audience of a dozen people including margaret atwood i thought yeah that's good she's got an amazing range of interests that's she's for sure. remarkable yeah yeah Okay, so it didn't do much for your business, but it was fun. Yeah, but it was fun. And a feather in your cap. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's one of the things I've done that I'm in, in life that I um, sort of rate quite highly. And then your cousin decided to sell the business. Yes. And you didn't agree with that. I, as wrong as I didn't agree with it, I, I didn't want to. But he had a majority of shareholding, so what he, what he decided... Um, went. You sold it to Waterstones? Sold to Waterstones. If it were to be sold, I cannot think of a better home for it. Waterstones are serious book people. James Daunt, who runs Waterstones, is an extraordinarily good bookseller and a, a very sharp businessman. So, so yes, we sold to, to Waterstones, and it was a great sadness to me. They'll keep the brand, though. They'll keep the brand, and I have to say, looking back, as we sit here in the middle of this COVID pandemic, I'm hugely relieved that I'm no longer involved in the retail business. From a personal perspective? Yes. I still take a great interest, and I'm still involved in the book trade. I sit on the board of the Booksellers Association of the UK, and I chair one of their subsidiaries. And I... Do you still consider yourself a Londoner? Yes, I do. Because I think that's one of the things that you you <laughs> attribute yes. to uh, getting inv- back involved with foils. Yes, La- yes. I, I having li- lived in in Africa and the Middle East and the, the Caribbean, uh, I then became a Londoner. I was born a Londoner, really. But uh, I have to say, five, six months ago, whatever, when the pandemic struck. We have, we have two homes. We have one in central London and one in rural Northamptonshire, about 60 miles north of London. We moved to the Northamptonshire home and didn't go to London for several months. And I have so enjoyed spending seven days a week in the country that we are reassessing mm. how we lead the rest of our lives. You mentioned at the end of the book, or you sort of question uh, what defines you, or even if it's necessary to define oneself. So, so what defines you? I think you're you're defined largely by the 
effect or impact you have on those around you, uh, you're defined by your family, and I don't mean your siblings, I mean your children, grandchildren, by the friends you make and the friends you keep, and by any marks you leave on life. I used to, I used to spend a lot of time worrying that I couldn't change the world, and then I realized that you, you, you only change the world for a small number of people, but if you can change the world in a tiny little way for a tiny number of people, then you've left a mark. So what are the marks you've left? How, how have you uh, done <laughs> I, that? I played a major part in rebuilding a much-loved bookshop. But that's uh, part of Waterstones now. Yes, but the name remains, and hopefully the name will remain. Um, James Daunt did give an undertaking to keep the name for us. I, I, I know I've had an impact on some people in East Africa. I'm helping to um, educate six of the grandchildren of my old house girl. And one of them, the oldest, is extraordinarily bright and I hope will go on to have a significant career. Uh, <laughs> it'll be forgotten in history, but I know I had a major impact on the economy of the Turks and Caicos Islands, which is a tiny little nation, <laughs> with 12,000 people when I went there. Um, I think they want to become part of Canada. It did. I know. There's a strange connection with Canada. And I've... I've obviously heavily influenced my children's outlook on life. I have a circle of friends who are a generation or so younger than me, and I spend time with them. What do you tell them? Poof. Some of the basic, basic rules of life. I mean, to me guiding principles in, in any interaction, try and structure the interaction so that both of you wind up feeling slightly better for having had that interaction. It sounds slightly pompous, but it, it's, I know what I mean by that. Well, it's a feeling too, isn't it? It's a feeling, yes. Like you, you can come away from being with someone and feel small to yourself. Or yes. Or something just not right, or you're irritated, yes. or but on, on the other hand, you can feel the opposite yes. whenever you're around someone. Yes, you go into a shop, and and you, you you can you can make sure the shop assistant feels inferior to you, or you can make sure they feel kind of that they've dealt with an equal, and it, it's just little things. The other thing, I'd, um, I've I've always had a very positive attitude. To life. I'm a positive person. And uh, one of my other guiding principles would be always say yes. If someone says, can you do this? You say yes, and then figure out how. Yes. So yeah, that's kind of where I am now. Hmm. Anything else? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's me. Well, thank you so much for yeah, it's a uh, pleasure. pleasure. sharing uh, it's, it's just valuable, I think, to uh, to capture uh, the essence of such a such a, a wonderful company. Yes, I think so. As I said, I think family business is terribly important. I think the book trade is terribly important. I think the book is mankind's greatest invention, and um, the people. I've had so much fun since I got involved in the book trade. It's a very gregarious business. It's a very sociable business. It's a business that's teeming with intelligent people. It's a very collaborative business. It doesn't mean you don't get backstabbing and so on. But I remember when, when we were opening our second branch away from Trancos Road... We then had a general manager who didn't come from the book trade, the chief exec. He was, a, like me, an accountant. 
but he'd never really gone beyond the figures. He didn't look at what was underneath them. And he asked me to give a guest list, my guests I wanted to invite to the opening party. And of course I included a number of other booksellers because they were my friends. Yeah, you know, the head of board, Borders, the head of uh, Blackwell's, probably some Waterstones people. And the chief exec looked at this and said, we can't invite these people, they're our competitors. I said, no, 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 they're my friends. And he, uh, he didn't get it. There's a dining club in London called the Book Society, which meets once a month. And usually about 100 people there. And they're publishers and booksellers and agents and uh, people from the peripheral bodies, uh, librarians, trustees, etc., and um, I don't know of any other branch of commerce where customers and suppliers and so on mix so comfortably. You know, if my family had a business selling cornflakes, I don't think I would have had nearly as much fun. And I, you know, my period, my time in investment banking, there wasn't the fun. You know mm. yourself, you know, you spend your life interviewing people in, in, in the book trade. Mm. Uh, what a wonderful job to have. Yeah. What are you working on now, just finally? I've written a memoir about my relationship with the Turks and Caicos Islands because it, it, it was an extraordinary period of my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to finalize that. It, uh, I will self-publish it, as I did. Yeah, can you just... <laughs> we've been going for a while, but uh, can you just quickly tell me how that worked? Because uh, it's, a, it's a very nice-looking uh, book, hard, hardcover. It's produced by the print-on-demand uh, arm of Ingram's, which is called Lightning Source. I self-publish it through, again, an arm of Ingram's. They all work together. Mm -hmm. So it's distributed by Ingram's. Um, I've sold about, getting on for 700 copies, and, you know, I haven't pushed it, I haven't marketed it at all. No. And you get to keep 80% or whatever. Um, what, what I get is comparatively little if it's sold through Amazon or bookstores. Right. If I sell any off my own website, which is billsamuel.co.uk, then good. I get to keep far more. But the Turks and Caicos one will we'll sell a few copies because there are people who are interested. But it's mainly for family and friends. Okay. You know, I've now got eight grandchildren, nine, including one who's adopted. And I realize that they know very little about me. To them, I'm just a bloke with a beard who's a tolerably good cook and who babysits them from time to time. And I'd like to know that when I'm shuffle off this mortal coil, that there'll be some hard copy left of what I did. So, Turks and Caicos, and then I'm, I'm also writing about my time in Africa, which I'll probably wrap into a general autobiography, which I'll spend whatever left of life I've got writing. I do think, I, I feel very much that everyone has a story to tell, and we now have the technology to get it into print. And it's fine to produce an e-book, but the e-book will disappear into the ether in time. Whereas of my 700 odd copies of that in hardback... Yeah, it's pretty solid, isn't it? Some will hang around. <laughs> this is going to last. <laughs> yeah, it's beautifully done. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. So very good. Lightning Source Ingrams, um, strongly <laughs> recommend. Very good. Well, with that plug, let me recommend the book itself. It was uh, fun okay. to read and uh, and uh, fun to talk to you. Thank you so much for been the time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming around and for enjoying this beautiful setting here.